Hey, Stargazers, welcome back. My name is Nick. I'm a theaters manager at the Adler Planetarium, and you're watching Skywatch Wednesday. Skywatch Wednesday. Skywatch Wednesday. All right, so a slight name change, but the same great content you've come to expect on Wednesdays. Well, this week we're past the full moon, so we're moving into a time now of less and less moonlight during the night. So I want to take a look at a few of the dimmer sights that you might be able to spot in the night sky, including the largest constellation in the sky. Any guesses what that might be? Well, let's begin looking south a couple hours after sunset tonight. We've got a wider field of view here than usual. We're going to be looking at a larger swath of sky, and this is going to help us get our bearings. We're going to be looking in between the brighter stars and constellations this episode, but if you need a refresher on what some of the brighter things are in the sky right now, check out the episode from March 10th for a good overview. So, we're looking south. To our right, west, is the winter sky, and to the left, or east, is the spring sky. You can almost imagine a gap in the bright stars here. The brilliant dog stars Sirius and Procyon, and the Gemini twins high above, and then a noticeably dimmer part of the sky before you get to Regulus, the heart of Leo, and Spica, the brightest star in Virgo the Maiden, down in the east-southeast. There are constellations in this darker part of the sky toward the south and southeast, and with a good stargazing app or a star map, some patience, and maybe a pair of binoculars, you can trace out a few of these dimmer sights. So we'll get our bearings here. Let's start between Leo and Gemini with the dim zodiac sign of Cancer the Crab. This is already very dim, but immediately below it is the head of a huge water snake called Hydra. You may have never heard of it before, you've most likely never seen it in the sky, but this is the largest and longest constellation in the entire sky. Its head is over halfway up in the sky as we're looking at it here, but its tail won't rise for another two hours. It has only one relatively bright star called Alphard. It's all by its lonesome here, and indeed the name Alphard derives from the Arabic, meaning the solitary one. It isn't a particularly notable star, but it is visible on clear nights from light polluted skies like Chicago. The constellation of Hydra was catalogued by Ptolemy in the second century, and it's based on a Babylonian constellation of a serpent. It's often associated with the Hydra, one of the labors of Hercules. The constellations surrounding it, though, point to a different mythological connection. Nearby are the constellations of Crater the Cup and Corvus the Crow. Crater is quite dim, but by tracing out the stars, you might imagine a chalice of sorts. Corvus is marked by a trapezoid of stars that's quite eye-catching from darker skies with good dark adaptation. From light polluted skies, though, it's a bit of a challenge to spot. The crow represents the crow of the god Apollo. Apollo sent the crow to fetch some water in a cup, represented by Crater. Along the way, though, the crow was distracted by a fig tree, and when it returned late to Apollo, it blamed its tardiness on a water snake, Hydra. Apollo, though, knew the truth and placed the crow, cup, and water snake in the sky as punishment. Well, there's another object riding on the back of Hydra. This one is a sextant. This has nothing to do with Apollo, but instead with the 17th century Polish astronomer Johannes Hevelius. Although he used telescopes to make astronomical observations, including to produce a remarkable atlas of the moon, he was a firm believer in using naked eye instruments to study the sky, such as the quadrant and the sextant. He was very much at odds with other astronomers who were starting to use the telescope for measurements and mapping. Here's an image of Havelius and Elizabeth, his wife, using the sextant to map the sky. In 1679, his house and most of his instruments were destroyed in a fire, but his catalog was spared. To memorialize his devotion to naked eye observation, he put his sextant in the sky. This is a page from his 1690 Star Atlas, a copy of which is part of the Adler's collection. In it, he introduced eight new constellations, seven of which are still used today, including Sexton's The Sextant. Well, if you're lucky enough to get to some dark skies this time of the year, something you should know is that the Milky Way doesn't look like much in the northern spring. The band of light we see in the sky is the plane of our galaxy, and what we see of it depends on which way we're facing in the galaxy. There are lots of angles to be considered. The Earth orbits the Sun, 
but it's tilted relative to that plane. Our solar system is also tilted relative to the plane of the galaxy. And during the northern summer, the night side of Earth faces the core of the galaxy. In the northern winter, though, the night side of Earth faces the outer regions of the Milky Way, so the band of light isn't as intense simply because there are fewer stars to be seen in that direction. And during the spring, as the dim wintertime Milky Way sets earlier and earlier, we come into a season when the band of the Milky Way isn't really seen at all in the evening sky, even from dark skies. Now, to be clear, every star you see in the night sky is part of the Milky Way galaxy. But in the fall, and especially the spring, we're looking above and below the plane of the galaxy in the night sky, so we don't see that band of light. We do see a few stars, but not much else. However, if our own galaxy is a little less prominent, this is a great time to look for other galaxies with binoculars or a telescope. Galaxies like M101, that's known as the Pinwheel Galaxy, and M51, the Whirlpool Galaxy, and also a nice pairing of galaxies here, M81 and M82, these are all near the Big Dipper in the sky. The constellations of Leo and Virgo are chock full of galaxies, although seeing these will require a larger telescope and a darker sky. And even the very dim constellations of Corvus, Crater, Sextons, and Hydra are host to many galaxies. In the directions where there are fewer stars and less stuff in our own galaxy, it actually makes it much easier to see outside of the galaxy and see others. Take a look at this 3D map of a galaxy survey. Each tiny red dot represents a galaxy outside of the Milky Way. But the galaxies appear to be arrayed in an hourglass fashion, two cones of galaxies, and not much in between. While there are galaxies in those empty areas, we just can't see them very easily because of our own galaxy. We can't see through the Milky Way galaxy along the plane, there's just too much stuff there. Dust and gas and stars, all of it wonderful to look at and study, but it does block the view of galaxies that lie beyond the Milky Way in those directions. So if you want to see the Milky Way arching across the sky, you can definitely see it tonight. You just got to wait up really late before dawn to see it rising in the east. Or have a little bit of patience, wait a few months, and it'll be gracing the evening sky earlier and earlier. Well, that's what we've got for you this episode. Thanks, as always, for watching. Don't forget to subscribe to Adler's YouTube channel, and also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. Happy stargazing, and we'll see you next time.